I'm Mark Keel, and I grew up in Denver, Colorado. I spent my teens and 20s living a destructive life of gangs, drugs, alcoholism, failed relationships. And in 2003, I was facing 15 years in prison from things I was responsible for. In 2005, I came down to Waco for a visit. I had never met some of the family members that I came to live with. And after spending time here, I saw a context where I really could change into something that was more productive and positive than the life I had lived. And I knew I wanted to be a part. After becoming a part of what was going on here that was bigger than myself, a few years later I was married and I have a daughter named Tikva, which in Hebrew stands for hope. I also help start a, a cheese business that's award winning and we distribute to hotels and restaurants across the state. And I've, I've just really become something positive and something different that I hope I can pass on to my kids. Hi, my name is Teb Seifu from Ethiopia. I was born in Ethiopia, came to this country as a young child, and grew up in this country. I, uh, I got familiar with all the things, drugs, alcohol, party life, living wild, and was uh, going downhill pretty quick. Uh, I found myself hitting rock bottom, smoking out every day, drinking, blacking out every night and found myself in a, in a pit and uh, coming to this place, coming to this community has changed my life. I'm a new man today. I'm married. I have a young child. I manage a timber frame business. We go all over the country, but today I live in a wonderful community. I have given my life to something that's worth it. And uh, I have a little child, a beautiful baby boy who I love and cherish, I love my wife. We have a wonderful relationship. All I could say is I'm thankful to be able to live in a place like I am today. My mom and dad divorced when I was three years old and I spent a good part of my life in and out of uh, children's homes, uh, foster care, foster parents, juvenile prison, involved in drugs, gangs, violence, uh, all, all, all kinds of problems. Um, when I was 18 years old, I came in contact here with the church in 1990, and I've been here now for 21 years of my life, uh, happily married with five kids. I manage a general store, and uh, life, God has been really good to me. My name is Barry Hirsch. I, I grew up in Brooklyn, and by the early 70s, Patty and I were living in the Lower East Side slums of Manhattan, and we had two little kids, and we were pretty desperate, and we were... We came to an early meeting and God changed our lives. Jesus became real for us. And, and uh, it's been our experience from back then until now that uh, this church has always reached out to, to people just like us, to people in desperate need. And it's made a lot of difference for a lot of people. Homestead Heritage is a small voluntary Christian agrarian community located in Central Texas. They are well known for their fine craftsmanship and their strong family values. Their teachings and simple way of life are reflective of the Anabaptist tradition, stressing a love for one's neighbor and an absolute commitment to nonviolence. But ironically, the quiet, peace-loving community has recently become the target of a dramatic and controversial public media attack. Secret lives behind the walls of a seemingly perfect community outside of Waco. I'm News 8's Brett Ship. Tonight at 10, former residents speak out. Why some fear for the children that remain in the community. What really happens in Homestead. A News 8 investigation, tonight at 10. This attack was instigated by former members who have abandoned the community's peaceful way of life and yet now accuse the community, and particularly its founder, of the worst kinds of violent criminal behavior. The story referred to the community as a secret gated compound. The general public is not allowed inside. It accused the church of having a policy of hiding criminal abuse of children, and even included charges of human trafficking to satisfy sexual perversions. In response to the story, 
Some viewers have begun calling for government investigation, even clamoring for a civilian posse to arm themselves to save the children. WFAA claims the highest ethics in their reporting of this story, stating unequivocally that in no case was it evident that any of their sources harbored an agenda, and that every major allegation was unimpeachably corroborated by documents or by witnesses to events under scrutiny. Brett Shipp has described his six-month investigation as a laborious quest to track down and authenticate allegations of abuse. But there were conspicuous absences in the report. No testimony from law enforcement, no interviews with members of Homestead Heritage, and no word from scores of former members who disagree with the nine individuals featured in the story. How could the story be complete without these sources? Why were they not included? Would they tell a different story? So the story here is that we have brought criminals to justice, but we're being blamed for their crimes. People from within the Homestead Heritage uh, instructed or escorted the people to come to us and brought them to us. None of those are related in terms of it evidencing an epidemic of something going on at Homestead Heritage. There's nothing that upsets us more than seeing children hurt. More than 85 other former members signed an online petition against this story. He didn't want to hear anything except what fit into his template. I grew up in Homestead Heritage. Uh, I was there for over 15 years and I left about six years ago. I know all the people that have made accusations against Homestead. They want to say it's about the children, but I believe that really they hate Homestead and have a vendetta against them. Pulling things out of context and digitally distorting videos or audio, you can make anything sound eerie or ominous. Brett Shipp twisted it to the exact opposite of its original meaning. It's a shame that these types of painful situations are being exploited in the media. I grew up in the community and we were just convinced there was no better place on earth. And to think that that could be destroyed by gossip that people have. We would give our lives for our children. If there's any story here at all, it's a story that we were on the side of the victim, and we still are. One of the most absurd aspects of the WFAA broadcast is that in making these allegations against certain individuals in our community, the reporter is actually making allegations against all of us who live in this community. And he is implying that we are all so mind controlled that we're not able to tell right from wrong that we no longer have the capacity to detect when somebody is beating their children, that we condone the abuse of children, that we are unable to speak to anybody outside the community who we see every day of our lives, and that we're willing to go along with whatever is told to us because we're so afraid to do anything uh, from our own initiative. And I have a PhD and I lecture all over the world and I personally find that very insulting. Brett Ship attempts to portray this as a closed community behind locked gates. But just beyond the locked gates, gated commune, the general public is not allowed inside. Gated compound, a secretive and tightly controlled religious environment. He even did an interview with WBAP radio in Dallas saying that people could only get through our into our community through this locked gate two days out of the year. 
And he even wants to leave the impression that this is some sort of concentration camp or prison compound. As the cafe manager, this idea just doesn't make any sense to me. We're open six days a week. The cafe is not the only thing open, but the entire craft village is open six days a week to the public. We have uh, school groups come through. We have tour groups. We do catering events on the land here. Here in about a month, we're doing a catering event for 150 physicists from all across the world are gonna come onto our land to see our way of life and eat at our cafe. That's not a closed community to me. Uh, again, they portray the community as if our children are isolated on this gated compound. And in reality, over two-thirds of our members live on their own pieces of property within the surrounding community here in Waco. The whole thing is designed to make us look secretive and scary. Video is a powerful medium, capable of producing strong and lasting impressions on the viewer. Unfortunately, it has at least as much power to convey a lie as it does the truth, since it can so easily be manipulated to make a fabrication feel like reality. Though WFAA strongly insisted that their methods did not demonstrate any bias, nonetheless, their presentation was anything but objective. They employed all the classic techniques of video manipulations to enhance the sinister effect they intended. For example, Note the video footage behind Brett Ship's false assertion that the general public is not allowed inside Homestead Heritage. The secretive and tightly controlled religious environment, the general public is not allowed inside. Now see the context of the video from which this clip was taken, a context that makes exactly the opposite point. It's a chance for us to share with others something that we believe is wonderful. The clip was changed to black and white, a black mask was added around the edges, and it was played in slow motion. Which usage more accurately portrayed what the viewer was actually seeing? Ironically, this video is footage of a standing ovation at an Easter music service at Homestead Heritage that was attended by well over a thousand people from the general public, including state senators and judges, Texas Supreme Court justices, and a former president of the United States with his Secret Service contingent. In another place, Brett Ship shows fuzzy footage of a classroom at Homestead Heritage, while he describes the purported screening process. Before gaining acceptance, adults go through several months of screening. But again, the video from which this is taken makes clear this is a publicly available seminar that our community provides. We now also offer classes in these skills to the public. The original footage reveals that it is in fact a gardening class. And then of course there's just the obvious carelessness uh, that's evident throughout the story, even in little things like he, he labels uh, Jeremy Crow in one place as Isaac Alexander. Um, when he's speaking about uh, Bill DeLong's home, uh, he shows footage of our public fiber crafts building in our craft village, when in fact Bill DeLong has never lived at Homestead Heritage. And there's another place where uh, the title screen says that Homestead Heritage is in Hutto, Texas. That's 90 miles away. But it's not just these small things. He accuses us of human trafficking and gives absolutely no substantiation to that accusation at all. Homestead Heritage had never even heard of Becky Crow's absurd accusation of human trafficking before Brett Ship aired it in his supposedly unimpeachably corroborated story. Though neither WFAA or Becky Crow had reported this criminal allegation to law enforcement, Homestead Heritage immediately reported it to the Sheriff's Department. Within a couple days, Homestead Heritage received a call from the person who Crow had apparently claimed was the victim. The alleged victim, who was quite surprised by the notion that she had been sold for sexual favors, said she had assured the detectives from the Sheriff's Department that the story was false and completely unfounded. Brett Ship's self-described laborious quest to track down and authenticate allegations, a quest that took him six months, apparently did not include a simple call to the Sheriff's Office. In Brett Ship's 
unimpeachably corroborated reports, he turns his attention to child discipline, abusive child discipline, and gives what is probably the longest interview and certainly the most uh, specifically described incident to Jeremy Crow, who describes his mother and father uh, beating their his five-year-old brother so hard and for so long that they would actually tire out and have to pass on the discipline to the other. Former member Jeremy Crow says he will never forget the night his parents beat his five-year-old brother. After Jeremy gave his detailed description, as an aside, Brett Shipp quoted Jeremy's mother, Becky Crow, who had already accused our community of human trafficking. Brett Shipp said that Becky denied the severity of the discipline that Jeremy had described. But Brett Shipp puts Becky's email up so rapidly that the reader cannot read what she says. And she does far more than just deny the severity. She even denies the central aspect of Jeremy's detailed description. She says, we didn't beat him until we couldn't beat him anymore and then the other take over. So in this unimpeachably corroborated report, Brett's own witnesses impeach one another. As evidence of his claim that Homestead Heritage has a practice of not reporting crimes against children, Brett Shipp presents an anonymous victim telling an atrocity story of childhood abuse by her stepfather. Though Homestead Heritage knows the identity of this woman, the cloak of anonymity conveniently conceals from other viewers some essential facts. First of all, whatever might have happened with this woman's stepfather when she was 15 would have taken place at least 30 years ago, before the woman or her stepfather had anything to do with Homestead Heritage. Furthermore, this woman was later a member of Homestead Heritage for about 20 years and has to this day never voiced to the church any complaints about whatever might have happened in her past. Apparently, this woman has still never reported her stepfather to law enforcement for his alleged abuse, but nonetheless, 30 years later, she is suddenly blaming Homestead Heritage in public for not reporting it. And Brett Shipp, who knew the woman's identity, still presented her anonymous story as representative of life at Homestead Heritage. Brett Shipp's story featured the testimony of nine former members, two of whom are anonymous. But he deliberately concealed from viewers the fact that more than 85 other former members had signed an online petition against this story. The petition included the following statement. My experience during the time I was there was that their church ministry would never tolerate, much less promote, make exception for, or cover up the heinous crime of sexual abuse of children. I therefore consider any publication or broadcast associating their ministry with such behaviors to be defamatory and not representative of their character, teachings, or practices as I experience them. Homestead Heritage specifically pointed WFAA to the petition almost five months before they aired the story. I'm making this video because of the recent reports on Homestead Heritage. Uh, I wanted to give my side of the story as a kid growing up there and uh, show that not all ex-members feel like this place is a bad place. And I am an ex-member of Homestead Heritage. And, you know, I've been watching. I've been watching everything that's been posted online, put in the news, um, the articles, just the media period. And, and um, something just rose up in me, and I, I have to say something. The accusations are beyond shocking. They are absolute blatant lies being spread. Uh, I grew up in Homestead Heritage. Uh, I was there for over 15 years and I left about six years ago. Um, I'm doing this because by the recent, recent allegations and uh, new to, news articles, um, the couple of clips that were played on uh, the news and etc. I was a member of Homestead Heritage. Um, when I heard about all these allegations and these lies, which I know for a fact they're lies because I went through numerous churches and none of them uphold 
the truth with the integrity that this church does. I mean, everybody was just always really kind to us. You know, even when I was just a little kid, you know, five, six years old, I can remember everybody treating me like I was their kid. And you know what, the older I got, it didn't change. What I hate to see is people get the wrong impression of what this place is about. These are good people um, as a whole, and I, I would hate for their personal or their reputation as a group to be harmed by these kind of negative uh, reports when there are other sides to the story. There are people like me who have chosen a different life, um, but still on a da daily basis, you know, pull, go back to those those memories and the character and whatnot that we saw in these men and women. You know, yes, they absolutely highly respect the confidentiality of us coming to them with a personal confession of our struggles, but it does not content um, extend to cover crimes, period. And all the all, all the accusations to the contrary are just egregiously false. I know all the people that have made accusations against Homestead. I know some better than others. And I know of activities they've been involved with and the way they've carried their lives since they've left. And the way they've treated Homestead since they've left Homestead. And, you know, the same people that are accusing Homestead of all these things, they have, they want to say it's about the children, but I believe that really they hate Homestead and have a vendetta against them. You know, so I don't necessarily buy into the whole, you know, we're trying to help the children act. I believe that they just hate them and they want them dismembered. And I would just ask them, you know, to leave them alone. They're good, innocent people. You know, has every situation ever been handled perfectly? No, but I've made plenty of mistakes in my life. And so I have a hard time pointing the finger at people who, if you know any of them, you know that they're just trying to do what's right. They're just trying to raise their families in peace. They're just trying to raise good children. You know, and if you don't have to agree with everything they believe, but just leave them alone. So that's all I've got to say. Thank you. You know, Brett Ship knew about these people, and uh, some of them, at least one of them we know, had contacted him, and he made it very clear he was not interested in talking to them. He didn't want to hear anything except what fit into his template. Brett Shipp left viewers to conclude that all former members agreed with the testimony of the nine that he selected. More than five months before the story aired, Brett Shipp began posting on a fraudulent Facebook page that he had created with a false name and a false date of birth. In his first message, he revealed his true identity and wrote, I'm working on an expose on Homestead Heritage. He said he was looking for those brave enough to go on camera to talk about the trauma and abuses associated with life within Homestead Heritage. In later Facebook messages, he wrote, It's my hope that my reporting can bring some of the horrors to light. If you are able to help me with this issue, I could use your testimony. If not, I appreciate your time. He only wanted testimony confirming his storyline. Brett Ship had been working on this story for two months before we ever even heard about it. And he had been going around and, and soliciting interviews from embittered ex-members. And um, we heard about it from some of our former members who, who didn't have an ax to grind with us. And they told us that this guy just wants dirt on you guys. He's not interested in hearing any perspective that differs from people that have a lot of complaints. And uh, so we contacted him and said, we heard you're doing a story and, and we're concerned about it. Can we talk about it? And we uh, talked with him on the phone. Um, we wrote extensive emails to him and to the management at the station. We finally convinced them to give us a, a meeting so that we could discuss our concerns about the story. We met with them for uh, about two hours, going over uh, uh, the situations and such. And and the consistent response that we got back was. This is our story. This is not going to change. The only question is, do you want to go on camera? After meeting with Brett Ship and WFAA management in Dallas, Homestead Heritage emailed them an extensive written summary of their concerns about the story and its sources, as well as a detailed account of Brett Ship's questionable methods in pursuing the story. Less than 20 minutes after it was sent, they received a reply from the news manager. Though it was impossible for the manager to have looked into all the matters in the email in such a short time, 
Nonetheless, he confidently stated, If there are concerns regarding reporter agendas, I can assure you that is simply not true. It just became clear that there was a frame in place um, that was, the story was going to be interpreted through that wasn't going to change. And it conformed to the classic stereotype that you might expect, the small religious group outside of Waco, and, you know, there were just elements to it we, we could feel that the, the direction of it was going to go into the classic stereotype of, of a cult. And the pieces that, of information that we might give them were going to be cut to fit that, regardless of the reality. And I think it's clear that our concerns about it were valid. Now that we see how he used the information we did give him, uh, and an appearance of fairness, an appearance of balance that would have been afforded uh, to the story by us giving an interview, would not have brought the viewer closer to the truth. Though WFAA insisted that no agenda was evident with any of their sources, most of the former members they featured have for many years posted malicious slander on the internet against the community, accusing them of all manner of atrocities. Aside from personal motives, some of Ship's witnesses have even clearly demonstrated a specific agenda to tear down the Christian faith. Jeremy Crow is my brother. I have a letter in which he says, Christianity has not unified the world, it has done more damage than good. It is a government tool to control the masses. Every time I hear you speak of the love of God, it makes me angry. He now believes that Homestead is a true Christian group. It is the culmination of the Christian faith. HH doctrine is in essence Christianity. But he goes on to say very passionately, I hate Christianity, I hate the doctrine. Another one of SHIP's selected ex-members, Tim McGraw, recently posted a comment on the Homestead Heritage website stating, I am now a staunch atheist who can refute every one of your God claims. McGraw also sent a message to Brett SHIP's fraudulent Facebook page, thanking him for doing the story and voicing his hope that the story would bring the charade of a wholesome Christian community crashing down. The sad thing is these people in Brett's story are individuals we once really tried to help and we loved and we still love them. Uh, I think of Timothy McGraw. He came to us, uh, his mother was from a broken marriage and we did everything we could to help her. And She is a wonderful sister still with us today, and, uh, an incredible pianist. And, and we're just, we're sad to see the bitterness and the, the false accusations that, that they have resorted to. and. And we hope that, that someday uh, peace can come in this situation. I don't believe that this context of media spreading uh, rumors and, and lies is really a context for healing or reconciliation. I think it's only polarized the, the issues. Um, but we believe it, reconciliation is possible. I think of a letter I received yesterday from an individual who who, who says that he was once a part of this group and he says that he spoke very evil of us and online and, and different posts and mocked our community and, and um, his life ended up winding out of control pretty fast and he, he just, just got out of prison this, this last month. And uh, he wrote a letter and he says, I knew that you guys were trying your best to walk in the light God had given you and to follow and to serve Him. You were happy doing it, and I resented you for it, and took every opportunity to make a mockery of you so that I could make myself feel better about the choices I had made. I deeply regret my behavior and the things I did to hurt you, and I hope you can find it in your hearts to forgive me. And we can. That's what the church is about. That's what our community and ministry has always been about. And all our hope for everyone involved is that they can find peace, reconciliation, and forgiveness. From the community's founding almost 40 years ago, the people of Homestead Heritage have always reached out to people from all walks of life, 
including those suffering from the worst sorts of social dysfunction. They have active ministries in prisons and drug rehabilitation centers. We've always made it our goal to reach out to people who need help. We feel like that's the purpose of the church, that's the purpose of a community, is to provide a place where people can, can come and uh, can learn to overcome whatever sorts of dysfunction they may have had in their past life. And whenever you have a ministry like that, uh, that's reaching out to all types of people, you're likely to encounter uh, serious personal failings in the people that you're trying to help. If you don't uncover those things, it's likely that you're not fulfilling the function that you should be as a church. And we've had some of that in our history. Um, about eight years ago, we encountered a situation that was unprecedented in the previous 30 years of our ministry. It was a situation in which a man confessed that he had molested a minor. And he confessed it to a lay minister. Um, the lay minister was unaware uh, of the reporting laws at the time, and the man said that it was a sin in his past, that the abuse had stopped before he even confessed it. And um, unfortunately, the lay minister did not report the situation to the authorities for about a year. Uh, we feel like that he did the wrong thing for the right reasons. And when the situation came to the attention of our board of elders, we reported it within 48 hours. And we also fully disclosed the delay in reporting to the authorities. We discussed the situation with them thoroughly and cooperated with all the ensuing investigations. Though the victim in this case was a young child at the time and is still a minor, Brett Ship interviewed her and shows her now claiming that the abuse continued during the delay. But court records reflect the fact that all subsequent investigations by law enforcement and Child Protective Services found that the abuse did not continue after the initial confession. Once again, Homestead Heritage had specifically pointed WFAA to these publicly available court records almost two months before the story aired. And in the few similar cases that we've had since then, we've reported them right away. And we just feel like it's a shame that these types of painful situations are being exploited in the media by people that are attempting to characterize our whole community by the failings of people that we've tried to help. Contrary to Brett Shipp's claim, none of the perpetrators were living inside the Homestead Heritage Community Farm. Most importantly, in every case, it was the ministry of the church that revealed the crime and made sure it was brought to the attention of legal authorities. Brett Shipp completely omitted this central fact from his story, yet other news reports easily verified this fact with law enforcement agencies. Former community members have now spoken out to WFAA News in Dallas. The former members claim emotional, physical, and sexual abuse towards children. They say the abuse was covered up. KCEN HD News reporter Tanya Ortega is joining us now with tonight's top story. And Tanya, you spoke to law enforcement about these accusations. That's right, Doug and Meyer. The McLennan County Sheriff's Office says several incidents of child sexual abuse have been reported over the last few years at Homestead Heritage. The Sheriff's Office also tells me the very leadership of that community are actually the ones who turn these people in. When these were reported, people from within the Homestead Heritage uh, instructed or escorted the people to come to us and brought them to us. None of the people that we've ever had to deal with were ever in a leadership position of any kind within the community. They were people that we were trying to help. Um, and also, we exposed and reported all of those people. None of those are related in terms of it evidencing an epidemic of something going on at Homestead Heritage. They're independent, isolated cases. Reyna says those responsible were convicted and are serving time. He sees no connection between their lifestyle and these crimes. In contrast to some high-profile sexual abuse cases that have been in the media recently, in our case, the perpetrators weren't caught by some third party that then threw us into some sort of crisis management mode. Instead, it was the direct ministry of our church that brought a crisis of conscience in these perpetrators' minds that caused them to confess their crimes. If it wasn't for the ministry of this church, these crimes might still be covered up. So the story here is that we have brought criminals to justice 
but we're being blamed for their crimes. Our focus in these difficult situations has been to meet the needs of the victims. Our community has gathered around to support them and their families emotionally, financially, in every way that we can. They helped us, they supported us weekly with a check, um, gave my older brother, who was the only one old enough at the time, to a job, they gave him a job, um, and then also helped us with um, all our spiritual you know, support, compassion, loving, caring for us, um, spending hours with us, um, just loving, loving us and praying for us and counseling us, just there for us. There's nothing that upsets us more than seeing children hurt. And that's one of the things that's so disappointing to us about the situation we're in now is that for those who are trying to heal, uh, the media attention has just opened the wounds again. If there's any story here at all, it's a story that we were on the side of the victim and we still are. We've done everything in our power to help these people and to, to, to better their lives and to put them back on course and to support them. The whole premise of the second uh, piece that Brett did was uh, uh, that there is brutal discipline of children going on in our community. We are nonviolent people. Our children are the, the, the greatest treasure that we have. Our children are the future. Nothing could be more appalling to us to think of selfish adults brutalizing innocent children sexually or in any other way. We, we would give our lives for our children. Mark Kieran claimed that we, uh, we have meetings where we uh, uh, taught people how to beat their kids without leaving marks. That's ridiculous. We never had any meetings like that. I've been here my whole life and we've never had any meetings like that. But, you know, even if we had counseled parents that if, if they uh, discipline their kids in such a way as to leave marks or harm them in any other way, they'd be going too far with their discipline. Is there something wrong with that? To support his allegation that Homestead Heritage promotes violence against children, Brett Shipp presents allegedly documented proof by quoting from a book written by Blair Adams. Adams asserts that God specifically tells us to use force in disciplining our children. Spanking a child, he writes, will deliver his soul from hell. Describing the book only as a 600-page treatise, Shipp failed to note what was easily verified on the back cover. Blair Adams' book had not only been published, but had even been recommended by William Bentley Ball, one of the foremost constitutional attorneys in the United States at the time, who won the landmark Supreme Court case, Wisconsin v. Yoder. Adams' book was also praised by Dr. Raymond Moore, an internationally recognized education consultant. Were these respected men praising a book that advocated violence against children? A closer look at the context from which Brett Shipp cherry-picked the fragment he quoted makes clear that Shipp's usage of the quote was twisted to support his predetermined storyline. The sentence that contains the phrase, use force, starts with the words, some would claim. The sentence is presenting a hypothetical position that equates violence with child discipline, a position that Adams is clearly arguing against. Nowhere else in the entire book is the term force used in connection with child discipline. On the same page, Adams writes that parenthood presupposes an abiding relationship of love that lies beyond exertion of mere power. The second quote Ship excerpts is not Adams' words at all. It is a direct quote from scripture. And once again, 
The larger context reveals that Adams is using the scripture to show a dichotomy between appropriate child discipline and violent force. So actually what this little excerpt is saying is that there is no place for violent, abusive force in a Christian's life. We are a non-violent people, and Brett Shipp twisted it to the exact opposite of its original meaning. Though numerous pieces of literature have been published by Homestead Heritage, Brett Shipp produces only one other document in his attempt to support his story, a document he mistakenly calls a membership contract and even a covenant of silence. In this covenant of silence, to never bring before the public outside our church any accusations or wrongdoing or any charge, lawsuit, or court action, agreeing that all disputes be settled within the confines of the church, and in return, the church agrees to never expose a member's shortcomings and sins to any outside its covenant. Once again, this fragment has been carefully extracted from context. And thus, when couched between Ship's other false allegations, it leads viewers to conclude that Homestead Heritage forbids its members from reporting crime. But the very fact that it was the ministry of the church that reported the cases that Ship cites demonstrates that he obviously misrepresents the implementation of this document. This paper had nothing to do with hiding criminal behavior. That's never been our belief. Our belief is that uh, criminal behavior is the proper sphere of, of the state. In fact, the document is not addressing criminal matters at all, but is only an agreement between church members not to sue one another over civil matters, a position clearly based on scriptural admonitions in the New Testament. Furthermore, many members of Homestead Heritage have never even heard of this document, as it hasn't been formally used in the community for about 15 years. The scriptural principle of refraining from lawsuits within the church has simply become an understood extension of their basic Anabaptist beliefs. The very book authored by Blair Adams that Ship quotes earlier makes it abundantly clear that the community recognizes the legitimate place of legal authorities in dealing with criminal matters. In one of many examples, Adams writes, we do not intend anything that we have written to deny that the state should, in fact, have authority over areas of not only our children's lives, but our own lives as well. In another place, he writes, Government certainly has the God-given power to stop those who truly endanger children's lives. Eugene Gallagher, Rosemary Park Professor of Religious Studies at Connecticut College, writes that those desiring to brand a religious group as cultic invariably put forth a stereotype. In his words, the most powerful image is that of the eerily powerful cult leader. Since Homestead Heritage does not have a single leader, but rather a plural cooperative leadership structure, the community did not readily fit this stereotype. So Brett Shipp just manipulated reality to conform to the expected stereotype. If you take a door that is a means of entrance and exit from a room or a house, and you take it outside of the context that makes it meaningful, that in fact makes it a door, and then you just hang it up from the ceiling or out in the yard, it becomes a strange oddity. What, what is this? It becomes absurd. If you do that to a person or their words and suspend those words outside of the context that makes them meaningful, you can make them absurd and strange looking. It's like hanging them in effigy. You can make a person or even a whole group of people look like something very strange, alarming, and, and odd. And it's really, that's really the case with uh, all kinds of things in our lives. You take an impassioned sermon and you pull out one sentence 
And people have no way of understanding what, what is even being talked about or why someone is feeling the emotion that they're feeling as they're speaking. Uh, and, and it can be made to look like something completely different. Um, even a soul-searching prayer. Uh, you take that out of the context of events and circumstances and relationship in which it was taking place and, and, and throw it out there all by itself and it, it can appear very unusual. And all of that is simply being employed here to achieve the goal of the stereotype. To, to take the, to make the, the, the figure of the all-powerful leader appear prominent. He was to be feared. I mean, he, you didn't talk to him. You didn't, um, I mean, you didn't even look at him. Others say it is that fear which allows Adams to control those devoted to his strict doctrine. Because it's the Spirit of God in the church. In his portrayal of the community's founding minister, Blair Adams, Brett Shipp presents selected fragments of audio pulled out of context and combined with an unrelated video. The video has been changed from color to black and white, overlaid with a black digitized filter and a tunnel effect, and cut into a series of still frames, a very different portrayal of Blair Adams than the original video from which it was taken. But they know the only way they could destroy it is by tainting it with, with slander and smears and slur, and, and, and that way they hope that, that they can take away our happiness too, but they won't be able to. So you combine the, just pulling something completely out of context, you combine that with uh, visuals that were unrelated to the circumstance, then you manipulate the visuals on top of that by applying ominous effects and stuff, and you're, you're providing cues to the viewer as to how they're supposed to take this little piece that you have presented. You've removed all the original context that would help them understand how it was intended, and you've added and manipulated material to place around it that guides their minds according to a certain uh, form of thinking. You're really, it's really an attempt to control people's thinking. I grew up in the community and we were just convinced there was no better place on earth. And we, we used to read a little book called Best Town in the World and we knew that was us. That there was just no better place. We had a loving, happy family and 95% uh, and of my friends, I'd say, have, have remained here and chosen to raise their children here because we see what's happened in the larger culture with the violence in schools, the drugs, and, and we don't see that here. We see something that's held together that's peaceful, that's safe, that's healthy for our children, and that's kind of the whole purpose of what we're doing as a community, is to provide that haven for our children. And to think that that could be destroyed by gossip that people have, or people could look at the exceptional cases that we have tried to eliminate from this haven of peace and safety and define us by those exceptions. It's just preposterous. It's sort of like looking at the chips on the floor when someone's making a piece of furniture and saying, uh, the, these are good for nothing. This, this piece of furniture is good for nothing and these, those are just the shattered chips when there really is a work of art there. I've just really become something positive and something different that I hope I can pass on to my kids. This church has always reached out to people just like us, to people in desperate need. It's made a lot of difference for a lot of people. Coming to this place, coming to this community has changed my life. I'm a new man today. I have given my life to something that's worth it. God has been really good to me. I've been here about a year and changed my life to be here. I would do it again. There wouldn't be a better place to raise my kids in the world. Oh, it's, it's the best place in the world. After visiting over 200 churches throughout the world, 
after seeing many school systems in the world, both in the Air Force and the United States as well as in other countries, I felt like what I saw here at Homestead Heritage was the best place with the best morals and the best way to instruct, train, and love kids. Just over two years, but I plan to be here a lot longer. <laughs> it's been phenomenal. I mean, my kids have grown, we have grown. My kids that live here, they, they don't know anything other than peace, other than love, other than friends. Oh no, I do not want to get out of here. I think we have the best life in the world. I wouldn't take anything else for it. And I think it's wonderful. For me, I found the best thing in the world. It's a real shame when you take the sins of a few and you paint it on the faces of so many innocent people. It's very troubling, but I believe that truth is ultimately going to triumph. I, I, truth always triumphs, and I believe the truth will ultimately be revealed. The thing that is a little hard to, to accept and to reckon with is that sometimes truth triumphs by, by hanging on a cross between two criminals. The truth will eventually be seen for what it is, but you know, we can't pick up all the pieces of all the lies that are spread so far and so wide, so ultimately there's some things will just never be made right, but you know, all we can do is continue on.